Hebrews. This will be our last sermon in Hebrews. We're concluding the series um, in Hebrews. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 13. We're turning in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 13 for those on YouTube. Um, and while you're turning, Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I just, you know, I praise God for his word. Um, my wife and I have a dear friend who, who stays with us on the weekends. She doesn't really have her own home. And uh, so she's kind of a gypsy, somewhat. She spends two days of the week with us and five days of the week with other friends. And um, yesterday, I, 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 I didn't have work. But God had plans. And, uh, and uh, we spent like three hours studying God's Word because she asked me to. And it, it, went, I, I, when I, it went so fast. And it was like the light of God was just on us the whole time and and we both agreed that when it was over with that this is the kingdom of God this is the riches that God talks about to feasting on the word of God and and, uh, and it was incredible and so I just wanted to share that with you as a praise in honor of, of what we were doing today and I praise God for those divine appointments and we need to be willing to step into them. I could have said, ah, no, I, I preach and teach God's word all week long. You know, what's, you know, come on, it's Saturday. No, not at all. You know, um, I want to welcome Pastor Dave and Pastor Lynn, uh, who pastored this church. Welcome. We thank you for the work that you did in this place. And we were talking about, they said that they were retired. And I go, do pastors ever really retire? And they go, no, we just stopped getting checks. <laughs> and so I want to welcome you. And uh, let's take a look at uh, Hebrews chapter 13. And the title of my message is God, our peacemaker. And my thesis of this message is this. May the God of peace make you complete in every good work. As a pastor, that is my goal. That each and every individual be made complete in God so that they too can be a part of the work. We're all kings and priests. Not just pastors. Not just evangelists. Not just missionaries and Sunday school teachers. Not, you know, superintendents of denominations. But all believers in Jesus Christ are kings and priests. And I believe it is God's will for you to be complete in Him. So that you too can be a part of the good work. And so let's, let's read this chapter. Chapter 13, verse 1. It says, Let brotherly love continue, and do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing so, doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled, but fornicators and adulterers God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines, for it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals, whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin, are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore, by him, let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share for such sacrifices God is well pleased. Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner." 
Now, the may, now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead and the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom, being, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. God, our peacemaker. Now, whenever we uh, approach God's Word, it is always wise to look at God's Word within the context, the three contexts. The first context is the exegetical context, the context of which the passage in which we are reading. And to do that, you can also read a little bit before the passage, a little bit, in this case, you can't really read much after it because it's the end of the book. But you read before and after, and you keep it within its exegetical context. Because we don't ever want to torture a text and make it confess to things that are not true. Then there's also the context of history. Where does this book lie in the history of mankind? And I love that saying that I learned when I came to this church, that history is his story. That when you put God's word within its historical context, it is irrefutable. It is unbeatable. It cannot be moved. And it will not be changed. And it will accomplish what it sets out to do. Either drawing you closer to God or pushing you away from God. But God's word is powerful and will not return void. And then there's the context of the whole. Because we know, we know that this book, the Bible, in its original manuscripts was inerrant. No mistakes. The Bible does not contradict itself. And if you think you have found a contradiction, what you should do is you should get on your knees and thank God because He's given you a learning opportunity. Because what we always want to do when there's a hard passage to understand, the Word of God is reflexive and we want to take the easier understanding passages, shed light on the harder passages, and let the Word of God speak for itself. And I'm telling you, if you do that, it will excite you. I, I, I continually get excited when God keeps showing me new things all the time. And the thing that we need to do as well is we need to listen to what the Holy Spirit is saying. And so what we're going to do is we're going to pray and we're going to ask the Holy Spirit to give us ears to hear and eyes to see what, what He would have us in the Scripture. Father, we come to You in Jesus' name and we ask Your Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into the truth, to demonstrate to us the fact that You are our peacemaker, that You do want to complete us in every good work. And Lord, I pray that we would see what You would have us to see and hear what You would have us to hear. In Jesus' name, Amen. The book of Hebrews was written around 68 AD. And it was written just a couple years before the Romans destroyed the city of Jerusalem. And we know from historical facts that in 70 AD, Titus of Aspasia uh, and the Roman legions entirely destroyed the city of Jerusalem, laid waste to the place. And when they were done, not one stone was left unturned, not one rock was left over, overturned. Over a million Jewish men, women, and children were butchered. And it was, it's a very sad, sad day in the history of God's people, Israel. And in order to understand what this book is all about, we need to understand that this book originally was written to Jewish Christians. Okay, Now that doesn't mean that we can't be spoken to through these scriptures. Even though it has a Jewish uh, uh, focus to it, it's also been focused to us as well. We can learn from it as we understand our Jewish connections. You see, one of the biggest mistakes I believe that the body of Christ has uh, done is that we have severed ourselves from our Jewish connection. The work that we are doing... Building the church of Jesus Christ is Jewish in many ways. We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he's not the God of the dead. He's the God of the living. And Jesus was a Jewish rabbi. He was not a pastor. They didn't call him Pastor Jesus. They called him Rabbi Jesus. And although we know salvation is for the Jew first, it is also for the Gentiles. 
And oftentimes, many Christians don't understand the nature of the church. I believe that if we under, really understood what the church is and who Israel is, we wouldn't have doctrinal disagreements on many uh, future uh, end time events. I really believe this. We need to understand that the body of Jesus Christ is an amalgamation of the Jewish world with the Gentile world. In the book of Ephesians, Paul tells us that Jesus Christ removed the wall of hostility between the Jew and the Gentile. And that he created one body, the church, the ecclesia, the called out ones. And when we become born again, we become physically, spiritually, and supernaturally connected to the head who is Jesus, who is seated at the right hand of God the Father at this moment. And that's why Paul in Ephesians chapter 2 says, we are seated with Christ in heavenly places. But if we approach the body of Christ like it's a corporation and the pastor is the, is the, is the CEO and the, the board of deacon, uh, elders is the board of directors and the congregation are the shareholders, then we don't get that. Because that's not the way God's church is. We're not a business. We're an organism. And when one part of the body hurts, all parts of the body hurts. When one part of the body is celebrated, all parts of... You know, if, if you're at a birthday party, you, you know, it's, it, your thumb isn't the only one celebrating. Oh, happy birthday. And the rest is like, oh, thumb's celebrating birthday. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know? No, if it, the whole body's excited, right? And when you smack that thumb with a hammer, the whole body's like, yeah! That is, that's the way it is with the body of Christ. Let, let me tell you something. I weary of this world because I know that my brothers and sisters are being slaughtered. I know there are places in this world where Christians are being butchered only because they are Christians. And it angers me, it saddens me, and it wearies me out. And so I find myself yearning for a better place, my eternal home, my eternal state. I look for the rapture of, the, of God's church, a supernatural event where Jesus Christ is in absolute control. And I laugh at these theologians who say, oh, I don't believe in the rapture. You can't find that word in the Bible. I don't believe there is such a... And I'm thinking, you can believe not in all you want, but it doesn't change the fact that it's real. You know, okay, so it's not... The word rapture isn't there, but neither is the word trinity. But yet I can prove that the trinity is taught in the scriptures, and I can prove that the rapture... Do you know that in Genesis 5, we have the doctrine of the rapture? Enoch walked with God, and then Enoch was not because God took him. What do you think the rapture is? It's God taking his people home. We have a Jewish example in Elijah, taken up by the fiery, cha by fiery chariots. Okay? You can find the rapture everywhere in the scripture. You really can. Just like you can find Jesus. And, and the doctrine of sin. And the Holy Spirit. And salvation. God has filled his book. Because God knows how the enemy will operate. You see, a lot of us, we only like certain passages. We, oh, I'm a New Testament person. I don't like that Old Testament stuff. That's just, you know, too, books are too long. I don't, I don't get it. I'm just New Testament. Well, you know what? Every doctrine that you need is in the New Testament. Oh, I'm Old Testament. That New Testament, that great stuff, that's just too sloppy for me. I like the Old Testament. Guess what? Every major doctrine is in the Old Testament. God's word is supernatural. God's church is an organism equipped with supernatural power. And our God is a peacemaker. And bring this, bringing this back into its historical context, because I was talking about the contexts, these Jewish Christians were beginning to fold under the pressure. They were beginning to play with the idea that let's go back to being Jews. Let's forget this Christianity thing. Let's forget this Jesus of Nazareth thing because we're not part of the congregation anymore. And, and, and that's a freaky thing because the Jewish people for thousands of years, well, hundreds of years at least, in order for you to be right with God, you had to be a member of the congregation of Israel. And if you weren't a member of the congregation of Israel, you were cut off from God. But now they were following this radical teaching that the Father seeks those who don't just worship in Jerusalem, but worship in spirit and in truth all over the globe. In fact, they're being told, go into all the world and preach the gospel. And as good Jews, they're like, 
we got a good year. And I can prove that historically. After 70 years of Babylonian captivity, when Cyrus gave financial incentives for the Jews to go back to their homeland, less than 50,000 left out of millions of Jews. Why? Because they were doing pretty well in Babylon. They were making some good money. They, were, they had established themselves. And that was home to them. Because you, here's, I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Jewish people prosper. And if you have a problem with that, you've got big problems. If you're jealous of that, you need to get over yourself. Because God has promised to bless them. In fact, the land of Israel will only flower under the foot of the Jewish person. And those preachers out there who are teaching your people that God has done with Israel, why don't you try reading Romans 9, 10, and 11, please? And why don't you start looking at the unconditional promises that, that God gave to Israel in the Old Testament, please? And stop deceiving your flocks with this replacement theology, which is nothing short of blasphemy. Amen. Because it makes God a liar. And it led to the Holocaust. And the Christian church needs to repent of its anti-Semitic attitudes. Salvation is for the Jew first and then for us. Deal with it. Deal with it. Okay? I take comfort in a verse where it says, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. So I guess I get to go before the Jew in some ways. See, it all works. You know, God has his ways, man. And we just got to be willing to let him have his way. And so here... And I believe Paul wrote this, and those of you who disagree with me, that's fine, you, whatever. But I think Paul wrote this, but wh whatever. The writer of Hebrews, he's concluding his argument, which if you study the, the book of Hebrew, he, this writer keeps saying that Jesus is better than Moses, and the tabernacle that Jesus ministered in is superior to the tabernacle that Moses ministered in, and, and the blood that Jesus shed in the eternal temple is superior to the blood of bull, bulls and goats and lambs, that, that, that Jesus is the better way. He's the better high priest. And he is the only way to God. And that was a radical thing. And these Jewish Christians were beginning, beginning to waver on this. And I want you to see how much God loved them and how much God loves us. God knew that in a couple of years, the Romans were going to wipe out the city of Jerusalem. God knew that. And we're going to take a look at this passage and work our way through that historical elements of it. But let's take a look at my first point is, this, is, is the writer is giving concluding moral directions. Concluding moral directions. And in verse 1 he says, Let brotherly love continue. Love. Without love, we are nothing. Without the love of God, we are lost. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. It is the love of God that saves us to the uttermost. It is the love of God who starts our faith in the beginning. Because the neat thing I had, the neat experience I had with my sister, is I was able to show her that we were chosen by God before the foundation of the world to be found in Christ Jesus and to be pleasing in His sight. Ephesians chapter 1, for those of you who don't know. And, we, and I also had the privilege of showing to her that Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, from Revelation chapter 13, was slain before the foundations of the world were even established. God was not caught by surprise when Adam and Eve sinned. God knew that Adam and Eve was gonna sin, were going to sin, and he already had a plan. He wanted to demonstrate his infinite love by becoming the innocent sacrifice to redeem mankind. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. And you can, you can want to worship Buddha. You can want to try to meditate till you get to nirvana. You can, do, you can try to do all these religious things. You will not find God. Because Jesus Christ in John chapter 14 Verse 6 said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. You want to find God, you've got to go through Jesus. He calls himself the gate, the shepherd, the way. Just saying. And so we need to let love flow. 
You know, I'm not a big Beatles fan, you know, when they sing, all we need is love. They were right. Pretty much everything else they sang about was wrong. But all we do need is love. God's love. You know why? Because love believes all things. If you love God, you believe God. I don't have a problem believing that the blood of a Jewish rabbi carpenter shed some 1900 years ago saves me from my sins because I love him and I believe him. And when he said, you must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, and he, was t he wasn't talking literally, he was talking figuratively there, I have done that. I eat of Jesus every day through his word. And I have received the blood cleansing power of his sacrifice that has made me one of his. And there's a supernatural connection between me and Jesus. And when I look at God's word, it's like, yes, I see that. <laughs> And then I run up to some non-believer, and they're like, huh? Huh? They can't see because they're dead in their trespasses and sins. And you know what? I don't think it's a mistake that seven times, you know, Jesus wrote seven letters. You realize that they're the, they're the letters of Jesus Christ? And I'm not adding to scripture, by the way. So I'm not a Gnostic. But there were seven letters that Jesus dictated to John. The Revelator. Right? And those seven letters, he spoke to the church throughout all its history. Because they're, they're, he actually was speaking to actual churches that he loved, but he was also speaking to the church of Jesus Christ throughout all of church history. When you take those seven letters in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, and you put them in the order in which they are, it demonstrates prophetically the history of the church. And if you were to change the order of those churches, it wouldn't work. The issues that those churches were dealing with were prophetic of issues that the church would deal with in certain ages of the church. It's mind-blowing. But what I want to say is, you know what, what Jesus said seven times? He said, let him who has ears hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You hear that, people on YouTube? You got ears? Hear what God's Spirit is saying to you. We need to hear God. It's not an option. You can't ignore him. We need to let brotherly love continue. It says, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unwittingly entertained angels. You know, we need to be hospitable. And you know what happens when you're hospitable? God blesses you. You might even have an opportunity to entertain an angel. Wouldn't that be something? However, not all angels are good. You might have the opportunity of entertaining an evil angel. And so you should be ready with the word of God in, in all cases and test, test that, the word of any angel that you make. And you might say, come on, preacher, you don't believe in it. Yes, I do. I know the supernatural exists. I have dealt with the demonic personally. It's real. And you can call me a whack job all you want, but I'm, it's real. I've dealt with it. And, and you know what? The cool thing is greater is he was in me than he was in the world. And God has given me all authority and power over every demonic spirit and evil spirit. They can't touch me. Unless God, God gives them permission to do something. And even then, he's just putting it in their face to show them how, you know, how wrong they are. You know, I consider a brother Job. God knew Job could stand under the, 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 the attacks of Satan. And, and he did. And then God blessed him when it was all said and done. Um, he says, remember prisoners as if chained with them, those who were mistreated, since you yourselves are in the body. Also, the, there were Hebrew Christians that were in chains. Timothy was one of them. Because it talks about Timothy being released. And, and Paul is saying, remember them. You know, God wants us to be hospitable. Okay? And then he says, marriage is honorable among all. And the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. We need to keep the marriage bed pure and holy. Okay? Now, it's not the unforgivable sin. But man, if you're defiling the marriage bed, you better get on your knees and repent and ask God to forgive you right now. Because God's not going to, he's not slacking on this. It's not like, you know, I, I've watched the moral degradation of our society. I mean, when I was a kid, there were certain things that if you said, said what people say now on TV, that, that station would lose its license. Now they can do whatever they want. 
You know, and there's, there's no standard. But let me tell you something. God has a standard and he'll have the last word. He'll have the last word. So you take, if you have a problem with that, you take that up with him. I'm just, I'm just the messenger. You know, don't shoot me. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Folks, are you content? You're content with what you have? We need to be content. And you know what? I struggle with this because I'm not a content person by nature. You know, when I was a kid, I was an athlete. And that meant there were challenges. You can't, if you're an athlete and content, you're not a good athlete. Okay, you, you want to get better and stuff. So to me, everything is striving, striving, striving. I, gotta, I can do this better. I can do this better. You know, I was so intense. I remember one time when I was in grade school, I was having a problem with a math problem. And the teacher said, you want this girl to help you with it? I'm like, no! I'll get it myself. You know? <laughs> You know, to me, back then, I was, you know, I was a male chauvinist kid back then. You know, it was a double slap. You're asking someone to help me, and you're asking a girl to help me. No way! I'll get it myself. And, um, and of course, that didn't go over well with the teacher. Um, but, but you know what? I'm learning to be content in what God has me. Because you know what? Here's the neat thing about being content. Jesus is with you. The Bible tells us contentment with godliness is great gain. So I want you to know I am content in some ways, but uncontent in others. And my discontent is that I want to get raptured. I don't want to stay here any longer than I have to, okay? But I'm content to stay as long as God will have me stay. And that is my balance. Because you know why? Why can I be content? Because right there, Jesus says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. You know, and if, if, if unfortunately we get thrown into prison because we're Christians, Jesus will be with us in the prisons. He'll be with us in our houses. He'll be with us in our churches. He'll be with us in our cars. He'll be with us on the street. Jesus is with us. We don't have to fear. In fact, we can have the confidence so that we can boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? If we really grab a hold of the concept that Jesus is with me, there's nothing man can do to us. They can't stop us. They can't stop the message which we will preach. Even if they throw us in prison, we'll preach to the prisoners. Amen. I don't want to go to prison. I want to be free. I, I, I love America. I love the freedom that America is. And America is free because America depended on the God of the Bible. And that's why America is free. And this nonsense that, oh, our founding fathers are atheistic and agnostic and, you know. No! Some of them dabbled in masonry. But they were low-level masons. They weren't the high-degree ones and stuff. And they believed in the Word of God. And they believed that, if the, it, that the job of civil government was to give freedom to the church so that the church can spread the gospel. Unlike the European powers where the king, who felt he was above the law of God, would enforce his brand of Christianity on anyone he wanted through the use of force. Big difference between European and, Christian and, and American Christian thought. Very big difference. Do you know that, that uh, the, many of our early colonies outlawed slavery? And then the British crown said, oh no, you can't do that. You're part of the British Empire. We have slavery in the British Empire. And they nullified those, those laws. So, so when the liberals start saying, well, the British got rid of slavery so much quicker than Americans did, you can turn around and say, yeah, well, the British are the ones that gave us slavery in the first place. You know? Oh, I just get so sick of people beefing on this country. If you don't like it, leave. Go, go live somewhere else. Go live in China, North Korea, Iran. Test out their freedom. See how far you get. Tired of the whining and complaining of people in this country who think they have it so bad. Every one of us as an American have a silver spoon in our mouth. So stop the belly aching and start praising God for what you have. Be content. You know, and, and next is concluding religious directions. And I like this. It says, verse 7, Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. And notice, he, God, uh, the writer gives us the ultimate example. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We need to hear the word of Jesus Christ. I'm not asking you to believe my word because I say it. 
I'm asking you to believe my word as long as it agrees with the eternal word of God. And here it says, those spiritual leaders who have been put over you, you bless them. Don't make their job any harder than it has to be. If you, if you drop down to um, verse 17, it says, Obey those who rule over you. Be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give an account. Let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. If you grieve your pastor, or pastors, whatever spiritual leaders you have over you, you hurt yourself. You, you hurt yourself. And you hurt the body around you. Because remember, we're all connected. Supernaturally and organically. That's why God wants unity in the body of Jesus Christ. That's why he says it's like oil. Warm oil just pouring down, you know, massagingly down the beard and the head. and It's like a hot shower erasing the aches and pains of this world. Because we remember, we all wrestle with our flesh. I have a flesh to wrestle with as well. As pastor of this church, I am not perfect. I have never claimed to be perfect. But I try to follow Jesus Christ as, 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 pos as much as possible. And I really try to focus on God's word. And it says, remember those who rule over you and who have spoken the word of God to you. And I believe here, this particular phrase, I believe that these Hebrew Christians were being warned to remember the warning of Brother Luke. Go with me to Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21, beginning with verse 20. Because remember, we want to put this in the context of who these people were. These were Hebrew Christians living in Jerusalem. They were thinking about returning back to Judaism and repudiating Jesus Christ. But they had been given a warning. And it all stems around Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And verse 20 says, But when, and this is Brother Luke, that Luke was written about eight years before the, 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 the epistle of Hebrews, around 60 AD. The epistle of Hebrews was written around 68, 67, they're not sure. It's about you know, seven or eight years later after the book of Luke. But the book of Luke gave the, these Jewish Christians a very specific warning. And a lot of preachers think that this is talking about the end times, and it's not. It's talking about the, 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 uh, the attack of A.D. 70. They, they get it mixed up because there are other parts to this chapter that talk about the end times. But this particular uh, bunch of verses is referring to A.D. 70, beginning with verse 20. It says, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, know that its destruction is near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let those who are in the midst of her depart. And let those who are in a country, uh, those who are in country enter her. For these are the days of vengeance, that all things which are written may be fulfilled. But woe to those who are pregnant, and to those who are nursing babes in those days. For there will be great distress in the land, and wrath upon this people. They will fall by the edge of the sword, and be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem will be trampled by Gentiles, until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And a lot of people think that this is tribulational. And it's not. The reason why they think it's a tribulational passage is because it's very similar to Matthew 24. It has some similar uh, features to it. But that's because both the tribulational passage of Matthew 24, they're being told, get out of the city of Jerusalem. But this was talking about AD 70, this particular passage. And this is the historical truth of it. In 67 AD, the Romans and Israel began a war with each other. They fought a war. Israel was tired of being under Roman uh, oppression. And so they began this war. And they waged this war for about three years. And it wasn't going well for the Jews. Because if you know anything about the Roman Empire, th these dudes know how to fight. Oh my gosh. You didn't mess with the Roman army. The Roman army stomped over huge empires. And they grappled with the Parthian Empire. They made the, the great Parthian Empire of its time quake. But the Parthian Empire almost also made the Roman Empire quake. It was like U.S. and Russia. But it's first century. Okay? And, uh, 
And so this war is going on, and, it's, and the general of these armies was Vespasian. He was the general, and he had a son named Titus, who was a captain in his army. And they were waging this war. And they, they, they were winning, and they had, they, they, had Israel, they had Jerusalem surrounded. They were getting ready to go in for the kill, and all of a sudden they receive notification from Rome, Caesar's dead. Vespasian, you need to come back and establish order, because there's chaos. And so the fighting stops. And Vespasian takes his son and puts him in charge, elevates him from captain to general. So now it's now, it's not Captain Titus, it's General Titus. Vespasian goes back. He fights the battle. Titus begins organizing his, his attack. There's a lull in the fighting. Vespasian goes back. He wins. He makes himself emperor. So now he's Caesar. He's no longer General Vespasian. He's Caesar Vespasian. And that means that his son, Titus, is now just by proxy, promoted from general to prince. In Daniel chapter 9, Daniel predicted that the prince that shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay? And here comes Prince Vespasian. I mean, Prince Titus of Vespasian. And he's, and, but there's a lull in the fighting. And in the lull of the fighting, the Jewish Christians who had these Scriptures who were listening to the Holy Spirit got out. They snuck out of the city while the fighting stopped. And when the fighting result resumed, there wasn't a single Jewish Christian in the city of Jerusalem. Not one Jewish Christian died. Why? Because they listened to the prophetic word of God and they obeyed it and it saved their physical lives. And if you don't believe me, Joseph, uh, um, Josephus, excuse me, he writes about it in his book of Antiquities. How that during this siege, not one Hebrew Christian died. Now if they had gone back to Judaism, they would have been in that city and they would have been dead. But because they stayed faithful... And they listened to Brother Luke, who was someone put over them, someone who was given anointing by the Holy Spirit to write the Word of God. They respected him, they obeyed him, and they did what he said, and it saved their lives. You know what the Bible says about rebellion? The sin of rebellion is like witchcraft in the eyes of God. If you are a rebellious person, in essence, in the eyes of God, you're pretty much practicing witchcraft. You need to repent. Not the unforgivable sin, but you need to stop being rebellious. You need to submit to whatever authority God has placed over you and do what that authority says. And if it's wrong, it's on the authority. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that we're to be blind leaders. No. We have the Word of God to direct us and stuff. And I don't believe a legitimate spiritual leader is going to tell you to do something evil. For instance, my God doesn't tell people to go and shoot and kill. My God says, go into all the world, preach the gospel, loving your neighbors, using the power of the Holy Spirit to guide them into the kingdom of God, and lo, I'm with you always. That's what my God tells me. Okay? That's a pretty good God who wants everyone to be saved. And so, get, going back to Hebrews, I believe the writer was reminding them, those who were placed in spiritual authority of you, listen to them. Hold on to God's word because God doesn't change. That's the neat thing about the word of God. It's eternal. God's word, John 3.16 is always going to be John 3.16. In the book of Hebrews where it says we're saved to the uttermost, it's always going to say we're saved to the uttermost, whether you like that or not. Where it says Jesus is the author and finisher of our faith. You know, I have good brothers in the Lord who have the saying amongst their denomination, we choose so we can lose. And I always point them to John 15 where Jesus says, you didn't choose me, I chose you. So I go, you didn't choose, so you can't lose. I mean, they did choose, but God chose them first. And we need to understand something. Unless God has chosen us, Without the Holy Spirit, we can't even admit we're sinners. We can't even come into the light 
unless the Holy Spirit brings us into the light. We are called to remember God's word. We are called to walk with Jesus. God's word will accomplish what it says. And we are to obey Christian leadership over us. And if you have a disagreement, you know, here's the cool thing about Christian leadership. You can pray for them. That the Holy Spirit changes their heart. You have direct access to the throne room of God as a believer in Jesus Christ. Just saying. And finally, the benediction. In verse 18, it says, Pray for us, for we are confident that we have a good conscience in all things, desiring to live honorably. But I especially urge you to do this, that I may be restored to you sooner. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. And then notice what, what the writer says. He says, I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word of exhortation, for I have written you a few words, knowing that our brother Timothy has been set free, with whom I shall see you if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you, and all the saints, and those from Italy greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. We are called to prayer because you know what, folks? You know what I've learned about being in prayer a lot? It removes guilt. Because it gives you an opportunity to ask God to forgive you your sins, but you're, you realize, I'm doing God's work. And one of the things that, one of the, one of the works that I do as your pastor is I pray over this body on a pretty much a daily basis. And I'm not saying that to build myself up and say, oh, I'm so spiritual, because I'm not. I'm, I, you know, I'm a, I can be carnal. I struggle and stuff. But I have a God who's faithful, and I, I take 1 John 1, 9, and he cleans me up, and he sets me free, and he removes all, all, you know, all you know, condemnation. I don't have to worry about that. But, but my prayer is this, that God would fill us with, our, with his love. That we would love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. That we would love our neighbor as we love ourselves. My prayer is that we would be so in tune with the Holy Spirit that we would step on scorpions and snakes. That we would cast down all demonic principalities and powers arrayed against us. That we would take captive every thought and every vain imagination and bring it under the lordship and deity of Jesus Christ. I pray for our physical healing. I pray for our spiritual deliverance. I I pray for the lost. I pray that God would build up this church, that God would glorify himself because you belong to Jesus. You were bought by his precious blood and I am merely a steward of what God has given to me. And so what I want for you is I want God's best for you. I want you to be on fire for Jesus Christ. I want you to be in love with Jesus Christ. I want you full of the Spirit. I want you rich in His Word. I want you in His Word. And that's why when we first came here, the Holy Spirit prophetically spoke to me and said, Bible studies. And I've been and, and, and doing our, uh, my annual pastoral report, I was looking at some years past, and in, in 2010, we had 80 occasions where we had a Bible study. And in 2013, we had 150 occasions where we had Bible studies. Praise Jesus! Because the Word of God will not return void. And I'm not the only one doing these Bible studies. They're popping up all over the place. And I, that jacks me up. You want to excite me? Say, Pastor, I'd like to do a Bible study in my home. Praise you, Jesus. Go ahead. You run with that, brother. You run with that. With the Holy Spirit's leading. Because I know how infectious God's word is. I experienced it myself yesterday with my good sister Charlene. I'm telling you, I had so much fun. I lost track of time. And, and you know what I was sharing with her? Things that I've studied for years. Things that I've known for a long time. But you know what? When you revisit it, you get all excited all over again. Woohoo! Look at what Jesus is doing! It's awesome. And for those of you in YouTube land, follow Jesus, man. He will give you a life that will be so rich and full and exciting and wonderful that it'll blow your mind. We don't realize how much. I believe we miss out so much because we limit God. We put God in a box. Right, here's, my, here's my Jesus in a box. I worship him on Sunday. 
On Monday, I put him away. Maybe on Wednesday, I might pull him back out. Ooh, the Jesus in the box, and I put him back on Thursday morning. That's not the way it works. Man, when I'm driving around, I got my Christian heavy metal, singing about Jesus. Woohoo, Jesus! You know, and I'm getting excited about God. And the louder and crazier the music, the more excited I get, because that's what moves me. Now, I know some of you, you like the mellow stuff. That's okay. Play your mellow music and get excited. You know? I have to admit, when I was younger and not quite as wise, I wanted to do a seminar. Mellow music, does it put people asleep in the kingdom of God so that Satan can get them? I only, I only did that, said that, because I used to run into these, well, Christian rock, is it of God or is it of the devil? And I'm like, really? Really? We're worried about some long-haired dude singing about Jesus and we think that's of the devil? Like the devil wants people singing about Jesus? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Anyway, God wants us to bear up with the exhortation. God has called you to a, a mission. You have a cross to bear. And he wants us to bear up under that cross. He wants us to crucify our flesh. Your flesh isn't going to want to do it. Okay, you know what my flesh wants? Beach ministry. Yes, where it's sunny and warm. Yes, beach ministry. I'll be a left, you know, throwing the frisbee, throwing the football, diving in the water when you get too hot because you're preaching too much. You know, that would be fun. <laughs> you know, but that's not what God has for me. You know, he has, he has this minute. And you know what? It's okay. It's good. I like this. This is fun. You know, it's, it's awesome. And the awesome thing about it is this. When people get saved, that's my number one joy. When people have the light go off in their eyes about, oh, I get it, about God's Word. That's my second greatest joy. And I saw that in Charlene. And she was getting it. You know, we were doing a Bible study. And she was bearing up under the exhortation of this insane pastor who's frothing at the mouth talking about, you know, the Scriptures. And you know what? Here, this God being our peacemaker who wants to complete us in every good work, He will give us the grace. Hear that. God will give you the grace that you need to overcome whatever you need to overcome, to do whatever He's called you to do. And I believe that God wants us to be overcomers. Don't always look for the easy way out. Get a little bit of, you know, blah, 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 and run through that wall. You know? If that's what God's called you to. Or leap over it. You know? Like the six million dollar man. <clears throat> but I do believe that whether God has us burrow under the wall, leap over the wall, or through the wall, or remove, removes the wall, He'll give us the grace to do what we need to do. And if you aren't saved, God will give you the grace to get saved. It's real easy. All you got to do is believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord and confess with your mouth that He is Lord and mean it and ask Him to come into your heart and He'll make you a new creature in Christ. That's it. It's free. You don't do anything. You just ask. That's it. And He does all the work. He's the author and finisher of that. But once you do that, my friends, once you, do, once you sign on, once you take the green pill, then you have to fight. You can't just hang around and let the devil boom, boom, boom. No, no, you're called to fight and called to run the race and called to serve God. God doesn't call bumps on the logs. He calls children to, to develop integrity and character and he puts us through hardships and trials just like he did his own son, Jesus Christ. Just like Jesus learned obedience through suffering, we learn obedience through suffering as well. But you know what? I'll, I'll close with these words. Jesus said in John chapter 16, he said, in the world you will have trouble. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord.